Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. Five days. The tractor did not necessarily mean that Mr. Fitzgibbon was getting ready to plow. He used it for many other things, hauling hay and firewood, for instance, and mowing and clearing snow in the winter. Mrs. Frisbee reminded herself of all this as she hurried over to the corner post. That was a very thick fence post at the corner of the garden nearest the farmhouse and the tractor shed. She had discovered long ago that it had a few inches above the ground. A convenient knot hole with a hollow place behind it where she could hide when she had reason to and watch what was going on in the yard. The cat, Dragon, also knew of its existence, so she had to look sharply when she came out. She came up carefully behind the post, stared this way and that, and then darted around it and up into the hole, all clear. Mr. Fitzgibbon had backed the tractor out of the big cluttered shed where he kept it, leaving the motor idling. He climbed down from the seat and called to the house. In a moment, his older son Paul came out, closing the door carefully behind him. Paul, at 15, was a quiet, hard-working boy, rather clumsy in his movements, but strong and careful about his chores. In a few seconds, he was followed by his younger brother, Billy, who at age 12 was noisier and had an annoying habit of skimming rocks across the grass at anything that moved. Mrs. Frisbee did not much care for Billy. All right, boys, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. Let's haul it out and see about that linchpin. It was about worn out last fall, I remember. It was about worn through last fall, I remember, Paul said. The boys disappeared into the shed, and Mr. Fitzgibbon remounted the tractor. He turned it around and backed it slowly toward the shed so that the rear end was out of Mrs. Frisbee's sight. There was some clanking and clanging inside the shed while Mr. Fitzgibbon, looking over his shoulder, worked some levers on the side of the tractor. All set, he shifted gears and eased the tractor forward again. Hitched behind it, clear of the ground, was the plow. Mrs. Frisbee's heart sank. Surely he was not going to start now. But as soon as he had the plow out in the sunlight, Mr. Fitzgibbon turned the tractor's engine off. It died with a sputter, and they all gathered around the plow hitch. Sure enough. Sure enough, said Mr. Fitzgibbon. She's just about ready to shear. Paul, I'm glad you remembered that. If I order it today, Henderson's will have a new one in three or four days. It took five days last time, Paul said. Five, then. That's about right anyhow. It's too wet to plow now, but five days like this ought to dry the ground out. Let's grease up while we've got it out. Billy, get the grease gun. In her hiding place, Mrs. Frisbee breathed a sigh of relief and then began to worry immediately. Five days, although a respite, was too short. Three weeks, Mr. Aegis had said, would be the soonest Timothy could get out of bed, the soonest he could live through a chill night without getting pneumonia again. She sighed and felt like weeping. If only the summer house were as warm as the cinder block house, but it was not. And even if it were, he could not make the long journey. They might try to carry him, but what was the use of that, only to have him get sick again after the first night there? She might have thought to go back to Mr. Aegis and see if he had any idea that had any ideas that would help. Was there some medicine that would make Timothy get strong sooner? She doubted it. Surely if he had such medicine it would he would have given it to her the first time. She was thinking about this when she climbed out through the knot hole and slithered to the ground below, not ten feet from the cat. Dragon lay stretched out in the sunlight, but he was not asleep. His head was up and his yellow eyes were open, staring in her direction. She gasped in terror and whirled around the fence post to put it between her and him. Then, without pausing, she set out on a dash across the garden as fast as she could run, expecting at any instant to hear the cat scream and feel his great claws on her back. She reached the shrew's hole and considered it for a fraction of a second diving into it, but it was too small. Then she glanced back over her shoulder and saw an amazing sight. The cat had not moved at all. He was lying exactly as before, except now one of his eyes was closed. The other, however, was still looking straight at her. So she did not pause, but raced on. Finally, when she was a safe distance away, two-thirds across the garden and nearly home, she stopped again, or she stopped and looked more carefully. The cat still lay there and seemed to have gone to sleep. That was so odd, so unheard of, she could hardly believe it. Feeling quite safe but puzzled, she looked for a vantage point from which she could see better. By rights, she should be dead and thought she had escaped by what seemed almost a miracle. She scolded herself for having been so careless. If the cat had killed her, who would take care of the children? 
She saw a dead asparagus plant, stiff, tall, with branches like a small tree. She climbed it, and from near the top looked back at the farmyard. Mr. Fitzgibbon and his sons had finished greasing the tractor and had gone somewhere else. But the cat still lay on the grass, seemingly asleep. Why had he not chased her? Was it possible that close as she had been, he had not seen her? She could not believe that. The only explanation she could think of was that he had just finished a very large meal and was feeling so stuffed and lazy he did not want to take the trouble to get up. But that was almost as unbelievable. Certainly it had never happened before. Was it possible that he was sick? Then, on what had already been a day of oddities and alarms, she noticed something else strange. Beyond the cat, quite far beyond, between the barn and the house, she saw what looked like a troop of dark gray figures marching in columns. Marching? Not exactly, but moving slowly and, in, and all in line. They were rats. There were a dozen of them. And at first, she could not quite see what they were up to. Then she saw something moving between them and behind them. It looked like a thick piece of rope, a long piece, maybe 20 feet. No, it was stiffer than rope. It was electric cable, the heavy black kind used for outdoor wiring and strung on telephone poles. The rats were hauling it laboriously through the grass, inching it along in the direction of a very large wild rose bush in the far corner of the yard. Mrs. Frisbee quickly guessed where they were taking it, though she could not guess why. In that rose bush, concealed and protected by dense tangles of fiercely sharp thorns, was the entrance to a rat hole. All the animals knew about it and were careful to stay away. But what would the rats want with such a long piece of wire? Mrs. Frisbee could not imagine. Even more curious, how did they dare pull it across the yard in broad daylight when the cat was right there? The rats were bigger than Mrs. Frisbee and could be, when necessary, dangerous fighters, but they were no match for Dragon. She watched them for quite a long time. It was obvious that they knew exactly what they were doing, and they looked as well drilled as a group of soldiers. They had about 25 yards to go to reach the rose bush, as if at a signal, which, however, was too far away to hear, they would all pull together, moving the wire about a foot. Then they would pause, rest, and heave again. It was about 20 minutes before the first rat disappeared into the bush. A little later, the last bit of wire disappeared behind them, like a thin black snake, and Mrs. Frisbee climbed down from the asparagus bush. All that time, the cat had slept on, and that's the end of that chapter.